the uh, Fellowship of Catholic Scholar for having me. Uh, I'm very eager since this is my first ever paper presentation as a academic. All right. <clears throat> what is truth? This is the question posed by Pontius Pilate when Jesus explains his divine mission to testify to the truth in order to save humanity through the forgiveness of sins. In modern society, the phrase, what is truth, is often the moniker of belief for many people grounded in the cultural atmosphere of relativism. Therefore, it is up to us as followers of Christ and his church to follow his divine lead and testify to the truth without compromising ourselves out of niceness or for the sake of the presumed well-being of others. Through the eyes of the beloved disciple, in the fourth gospel, we see the example of Jesus as the one who testifies to the truth boldly without apology. In particular, the fourth evangelist places Jesus in a position akin to a trial scene where he must publicly declare his divine authority and mission to Judean interlocutors in the latter half of the eighth chapter. <clears throat> Throughout the history of Johannine scholarship, it is often assumed that the fourth evangelist is writing from a distinctive anti-Jewish perspective. However, when analyzing the eighth chapter of John, we shall see that this understanding could not be further from the truth. The sacred author and the early Jesus movement as a whole was a movement within the greater religion of Judaism. In other words, an intra-familial dispute. Understanding polemics from this perspective allows Catholics to view the hostility of others the way Jesus did, acting in accordance with his divine mission. From an exegetical point of view, the fourth evangelist authored his writings to address a community that must continue to retain their fidelity to the Lord Jesus in the face of criticism from their surrounding non-believing brothers. As a result, the way that Jesus acts as shown in the pages of the fourth gospel might perhaps serve as an interpretive model for Catholics to follow in order to live the truth of their faith in their public and private lives without compromise. In the second half of the eighth chapter, Jesus finds himself speaking in the treasury of the Jewish temple, debating against the Jews during the Feast of Tabernacles. Before tackling this pericope, it is critical to understand the historical context of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was one of the most popular of the three feasts of pilgrimage at the time. It was the Feast of Eschatological Hope for the Israelites as it was associated, though not exclusively, as we shall see, with Yahweh's protection and care for his people during the Exodus. It also pointed toward the end of time when Yahweh would once again be united intimately with his people. The time during the Second Temple, the Feast of Tabernacles included a torch-lit illumination of the temple, reminiscent of the primeval light created by God on the first day. Nevertheless, it is, it is essential to acknowledge that there exists a correlation between the mention of Abraham, the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, and a Jewish work from the Second Temple BC known as Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees was well known during the first century. A notable work amongst Quran, amongst those in Quran, excuse me, the Book of Jubilees reads as a revelation from Yahweh to Moses in a retelling of the narratives of Genesis and Exodus. The author of Jubilees makes the clear teaching that the people of Israel always were and always will be the chosen people of God. To show this, the sacred author reinvents the festivals and priesthood established, established by Abraham 
as opposed to Moses. However, this primordial covenant is not based on the faithfulness of Israel, but on Yahweh's steadfast love and faithfulness to the people of Israel. One such story in particular within the book of Jubilee that is imperative for our purposes is the return of the holy vis visitors in Jubilee 16. Abraham is viewed as the founder of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he even gives the feast its name. At this point of the story, Abraham and Sarah have just given birth and circumcised Isaac. The angels make a flattering prophecy that Abraham will go on to have six more sons. In particular, one of the offspring of Isaac will emerge as a holy seed, leading to the formation of a family that holds an individual place in a covenantal relationship with Yahweh. Abraham and Sarah are so happy that his response to this news by the holy visitors is to celebrate and then establish the Feast of Tabernacles. Let me be clear. It is the joy of Abraham that leads to the creation of the Feast of Tabernacles, and it is this link that the fourth evangelist makes between John 8 and Jubilee 16. According to Jubilees chapter 16, verse 26, Abraham's joy in establishment of the Feast of Tabernacles stemmed from his heavenly promise of the coming advent of the Holy See. The evangelist makes it clear in Jesus' words in John 8, 56, that our Lord sees himself as the fulfillment of that promise to Abraham. Notice John's use of the Greek word hina in verse 56. The inclusion of this term implies a forward-looking event during Abraham's life. According to Jesus, it can be inferred that there was an incident in Abraham's life that, that enabled him to foresee the advent of the Lord. In other words, the exegesis performed by our Lord is one which interprets this text in messianic terms. This interpretation is made more evident in the fact that Jubilee states that the holy seed of Abraham will be like the one who made everything. Or to put it another way, to be like the creator. By labeling Jesus as the reason for Abraham's rejoicing, the fourth evangelist intends to teach that it is Jesus who is the fulfillment of the promise to be the holy seed that is to be like the creator, the divine messiah, testifying to his divine mission. When Jesus states that he is the reason for Abraham's rejoicing, he is undoubtedly making it clear that the Jews are not outside the family of God and therefore are not denied the inheritance of the new covenant, but the exact opposite. Those who accept Jesus as the seed inherit the promise of the same family. After referencing Jesus, Jubilee 16, Jesus goes further in his argument with the famous statement in the Greek, Preen Abram inestai ego ani, or before Abraham was, I am. From a polemical standpoint, Jesus completely flips the exegesis of the Pharisees against them. In the previous verses, the Jews claim that they are the seed of Abraham, recalling Jubilee 16, applying the promise of Isaac to themselves. Oddly, Jesus recognizes this legitimate claiming of Abrahamic lineage for his contemptuous interlocutors. However, in, recognizing, in recognition of the truth of their words, he did not compromise on the truth of his own words. Jesus stayed true to his divine mission, inaugurating the new covenant as the one true God of Israel incarnate on earth. In other words, Jesus uses the Pharisees' argument against them as an offensive attack to make a divine claim. The Pharisees present a causal argument suggesting that their lineage can be traced back to Abraham. In response, Jesus counters the Jews' claim by asserting that he existed long before Abraham existed. To put it a different way, Jesus asserts that all things, including Abraham, trace their origins back to him. In his rebuttal, Jesus claims a lineage that transcends the seed of Abraham. 
Jesus' actions in John 8 encourages Catholics to embrace and embody the, the principles and truth of Christ, eliminating the presence of sin and cowardice. By embracing the revealed truth as revealed in the life of Jesus, Catholics can testify to the divine identity of Jesus and his mission, despite pressure from unbelieving neighbors. The insertion of this narrative within the Gospel of the Lord by the fourth evangelist serves a distinct purpose. purpose. <clears throat> the purpose of the inclusion of this disputation is to inspire and give hope to a community of readers that has faced challenges from their brethren who have either not yet accepted the truth of the Messiahship of Jesus or have outright rejected it. It is important to note that the audience of the fourth Gospel, as well as its sacred author, would have likely been first century Jews. If the fourth evangelist viewed this exchange as an interfamilial conflict, as I argue, then this model serves as a that, then this story serves as a model for Catholics undergoing hostile disagreement. Notice how Jesus does not contradict the truth of the Jews' claims, but instead uses it to bolster his own argument. In a sense, the fourth evangelist desires to teach desires to teach believers, excuse me, in a sense, the, the, fourth, the fourth evangelist desires to teach that when a believer encounters disagreement among his contemporaries, he, did not, he does not compromise his fidelity in recognizing the truth in the errors of his brother. Rather, because all truth ultimately belongs to God, the Catholic can use the truths used by his interlocutors against them to further their own mission spreading the gospel, just as Jesus did, in recognizing the legitimacy of the Jews being descendants of the seed of Abraham. In conclusion, Jesus' of act Jesus of actions serve as a model for Catholics to never compromise their message and to defend the truth of God. Thank you very much.